I'm going to be talking this morning and continuing our series in Acts, and we're going to be looking at the subject of courage and boldness. Some of you are already going, ooh, what's that going to mean? It was really interesting. We had a prayer meeting here a few weeks ago for Crystal Palace, and there were many of us gathered in the room. We were praying together, and Sam got up and said, I want us to pray for Palace, that we'd be courageous and bold, and we'd declare the gospel to our friends and, and be able to preach that. I want us to be a bold expression of Christianity up there. Can we do that? And everyone in the room went, yeah. And then he went, great. And he got this microphone, and he went, who wants to pray? And everyone went, ooh. <laughs> And sometimes there's an element of we can be up for courage and boldness as long as it doesn't really involve me. (laughs) Anybody else struggle with that? I do. I get really fired up and then, but actually on the face-to-face practical value, I think actually this is hard. So we're going to look at this subject this morning. Can I pray for us before we do? Is that okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Lord, I bless you for our children. Lord, and, uh, and Lord, what you've been doing with them. It's been wonderful. Lord, we are going to need boldness and courage to really change this world and to do everything you've called us to do. And so this morning, as we unpack your truth, as we look into this topic, God, please send your spirit. Lord, I realize that without you inhabiting these words, without your spirit coming to inspire and coming to challenge and coming to transform It's just me trying to build hype. And Lord, I don't want to build hype this morning. I want to preach truth. Lord, I want to preach truth. I want your truth to set fire in our hearts. God, I pray, please give me skill to be able to articulate well what I feel you've given me to say. But Lord, I pray for each of us. Would you open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to receive what you would have for us that we might be bold and courageous and go out and bless this world that needs you so, so much. Please help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a week of courtroom drama in the Christian news world this week. I don't know how many of you have uh, seen this, but there have been a number of stories in the press, literally hours apart, about different things happening in courtroom settings this week. Uh, Can we have the first picture up, please, Pauline? This is Amber Geiger. She's a police officer from America, and uh, Amber has just been sentenced to 10 years in prison for murdering a black man in his apartment in America. Uh, Her story goes that she got home late from a shift. She was texting uh, her partner as she was walking up the stairs, and she missed, uh, or, or she wasn't paying attention. She went to the apartment above hers, walked into that apartment thinking it was hers, noticed this man sat on a sofa just eating a bowl of ice cream, and she pulled out her gun and she shot him dead. Um, It's just horrendous, horrendous, horrific story that has caught the attention of uh, the nation in America and has made the press over here, not particularly because of the crime. Actually, these crimes happen all the time, and they go unreported, and that is a travesty in itself. But they've been, they caught the attention because the brother of the victim has done something absolutely incredible. This is the brother of the victim. Can we play the clip, please, Pauline? I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone but I don't even want you to go to jail I want the best for you because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do and the best would be give your life to Christ I don't know if this is possible but can can I give her a hug please please Yes. Ha, ha, ha. 
behavior makes no sense without the gospel. Makes the world wonder. How'd you do that? How'd you embrace the murderer of your brother? I don't know if you heard what he said. You might have missed it because it skipped over it quite quickly. But he said, I'm not going to say, I hope you rot and die. Just like my brother did. I personally want the best for you. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what both of them, my brother, would have wanted you to do. And the best would be, give your life to Christ. Here is a man who understands, actually, that the only way that this woman can receive forgiveness and ultimate healing and, and the only way that actually this can properly be worked out is through the salvation of Jesus Christ. And so he preaches the gospel to her and it's so moving in his heart that he's moved to embrace her. It's just amazing. To say these words, let alone have the courage to embrace someone who has caused you incredible pain, is such a witness and a testimony to the gospel at work. Hours later, literally hours later, another story from a uh, employment tribunal pops up in the UK news. Can we have the next picture, please, Pauline? Does anybody know who this guy is? This is Dr. Uh, David Macarith. Dr. David Macarith has been uh, battling, he's an NHS doctor, and he has been um, essentially sacked from his position because he refused to use uh, what he deemed as the wrong pronouns for a ja transgender person who was sat in front of him. He decided, I don't want to go down that road. Um, and after repeatedly being warned that if he didn't change his mind, then he would lose his job. He stated that, I'm sorry, I believe in Genesis 1, 27. Uh, God created them, male and female, he created them. To, to use another pronoun is not actually in the best interest of that person. I'm going along with something which is just not true and is just wrong. And he lost his job. And this is what happened in the employment tribunal. This is reported from, uh, I've nicked this story from Premier Christianity magazine, but it was reported widely in lots of other news outlets. A Christian doctor who was forced out of his job working for the Department uh, for Work and Pensions after refusing to use transgender pronouns has lost his employment tribunal case. Dr. David Macrith said he was sacked from his job for refusing to identify clients by their chosen gender instead of their biological sex. The tribunal ruled that his biblical view was incompatible with human dignity. This needs to get you, right? If that sentence doesn't move you in some way maybe pray about that the ruling stated belief in Genesis 127 lack of belief in transgenderism and conscientious objection to transgenderism in our judgment are incompatible with human dignity and conflict with the fundamental rights of others specifically here transgender individuals at proceedings in July giving evidence Dr. Macrith said had said that he was asked in a conversation with his line manager, if you have a man six foot tall with a beard who says he wants to be addressed as she and Mrs., would you do that? Dr. Macrith, who now works as an NHS emergency doctor in Shropshire, said that in good conscience he could not do this and said that his contract was subsequently terminated over his refusal. <coughs> According to Christian Concern, which is giving the doctor legal support, he told the tribunal he was suspended the following month after being interrogated by his boss for refusing to call any six-foot bearded man madam on his whim. The, medical, the medic claims he was told he was overwhelmingly likely to lose his job unless he agreed. Dr. Macrith left his role on the 25th of June 2018 after an email exchange with his boss in which he was instructed to follow the process as discussed in your training. He gave evidence that he did not resign his position and was the victim of direct discrimination and harassment. Andrea Williams from Christian Concern told Premier the ruling was a crushing of Christian beliefs. Dr. David Macrith, for almost 30 years, has been working in A&E, loves his patients, and treats everyone with care, she said. Dr. Macrith was gentle. He would have called a person by their chosen name. What he couldn't do was put on a form that a biological man was a biological woman or a biological woman was a man. Responding to the judge's ruling, Dr. Macrith said, I'm not alone in being deeply concerned by this outcome. 
Staff in the NHS, even those who do not share my Christian convictions, are also disturbed as they see their own freedom of thought and speech being undermined by the judge's ruling. No doctor or researcher or philosopher can demonstrate or prove that a person can change sex. Without intellectual and moral integrity, medicine cannot function, and my 30 years as a doctor are now considered irrelevant compared to the risk that someone else might be offended. Dr. Macrith said he will appeal in order to fight for the freedom of Christians. A remarkable story, and one that should grip us and move us. And this, um, this is not this morning to attack any individual person, but we must be aware of the change of scene out in the world right now. Okay, we need to be aware of what's going on. I don't want to debate whether or not it was important for this doctor to use the correct pronouns for a transgender person. I don't even really want to address transgenderism at all this morning. I want to address this line written down in the documented uh, transcript from the tribunal. It says, belief in Genesis 1.27, which we all know says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Belief in Genesis 127 is incompatible with human dignity and conflict with the fundamental rights of others. What absolute junk. What a mess. What an absolute mess. Do you know what the leading story on Sky News was, on the Sky News app last night? Hundreds of people who have had a transgender operation are now changing their minds and want to come back to their original support and are feeling ousted and, outside and, and being made uh, like anathema to the transgender community because they're saying, I think I made a mistake and I want to go back. We live in a generation which is utterly confused, utterly lost, doesn't know where it's going, and the fundamental principle now is not the basic objective belief of right or wrong, but whether or not your view might offend someone. And we have to come to grips and come to the acceptance that the gospel is offensive. It's offensive. It is. And so part of me was sat preparing this message on boldness, and a little bit of me was like, well, you know, we live in a Christian country, don't we? We have freedoms, we're free to gather, we're free to worship, you know, I'm free to share my faith and stuff like that. But look at where we're going. We must be aware. For us to live out our basic understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, each of us who belong to him, in the future, the near future, are going to require boldness and courage. These are the times we now live in. We live in a post-Christian culture. That's where we're at. Our nation no longer considers itself a Christian country. Ethically and morally, it's headed in a completely different direction to basic biblical principles. By the way, you can never really be a Christian country. A nation, it's about, to be a Christian is to have a relationship with God, right? We can't declare that over our country, but we can preach it and be built on the morals of it. As I said before, the Generation Zers, so the one after millennials, you guys sat at the back, those of you born between 96 and 2010, are considered the first biblically illiterate generation to belong to the modern Western world. Mark Sayers, uh, Australian commentator uh, on uh, culture and also a great teacher of the word, says this, in the post-Christian culture we have great coffee and we have no meaning. We strive for the freedom to enjoy a four pound or four dollar cup of coffee, as he says. But actually, people everywhere are struggling to understand why are they here? What really matters? What is life about? No objective standard anymore. Right and wrong now come down to whether or not someone is offended. And as I said before, the gospel is offensive. I don't want us to get missed, though. God is not upset about, well, he is upset about this, but God is not anxious about this. He knows what he's doing. There is, if anything, we can praise God for some of these stories because it means that the battle lines are being drawn, okay? They are clearer than ever before. It's getting easier now to distinctively say that is right and that is wrong. We know now what the, some of the things are that we need to stand against. And please don't hear me this morning. I'm not preaching hate against anyone, any individual whatsoever. This is not supposed to come with judgment over anybody. But we must stand against the world and declare the purposes of God. We must be ready to state right from wrong. We need boldness. 
God in these times is calling his church to supernatural boldness. Do you believe that? We need boldness to proclaim the gospel as a primary. That's the main reason we need boldness, to go and tell the world. Tell the world that there's a God who loves them. Tell the world that there is a God who created them in his image. Tell the world that there is a forgiveness and mercy available in him. We need boldness to do that. It's getting harder to do that. We need boldness to stand firm. We need boldness to follow the way of Jesus. Thankfully, if you want inspiration when it comes to boldness, there is no better place to look than the book of Acts. There really is not. Every single page is dripping with testimony of men and women who just pushed the boat out. Men and women who really were radical in their faith. They were radically transformed by something that God did to them and they could not be the same. Some facing death, some facing persecution, some facing hardship and harm, they still stand in the face of all of that coming their way and they say, actually, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to follow God. We're not going to back down on this. Incredibly bold for the Lord in the face of extreme consequences. They're sold out for Jesus. Michael Green, in his book Evangelism in the Early Church, says, Here were men and women of every rank and station in life, of every country in the known world, so convinced that they had discovered the riddle of the universe, so sure of the one true God whom they had come to know that nothing must stand in the way of their passing on this good news to others. They might be slighted, laughed at, disenfranchised, robbed of their possessions, their homes, even their families but this would not stop them. They might be reported to the authorities as dangerous atheists and required to sacrifice to imperial gods, but they refused to comply. In Christianity, they had found something utterly new, authentic, and satisfying. They were not prepared to deny Christ in order to preserve their own lives, and in the manner of their dying, they made converts to their faith. We belong to the same faith. These radical Christians we have so much to learn from. The boldness and courage of the early church played a huge part in its rapid growth. And we need that same boldness today. And what I'd like for us to do is go back to a courtroom. So have a look at it. Is that okay? Turn in your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to try and zip through this as quickly as possible because you might be able to tell I've got quite a bit to say. So we're in Acts chapter 4, if I can find it as well, here we go. The context of where we are, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus has ascended into heaven, promised the falling of his Holy Spirit, the baptizing of the Spirit to his believers, that happens on the day of Pentecost, they receive this power which is absolutely transformative, they spill out onto the street and they start preaching the gospel. And the church grows quickly. 3,000 people added day one. That's not bad work. That's not bad work at all. And then Peter and John are continuing to do this work and to minister in power of the Spirit. And they're on the way to the temple. Uh, This is in Acts chapter 3. They're on their way to the temple and they see a lame beggar by the side of the road who asks them for money. And we have this famous story of Peter. It's a wonderful story, actually, when you read it. You've got Peter who... Uh, sees this guy, who's obviously well known, he's been there for a long time, we find out a bit later on that he's over 40 years old, so he's been outside the temple for a long, long time, and Peter says to him, look at me, look at me, just make eye contact, and there's something happens in the spirit, and he gets a prompt, and he does something incredibly bold, he says this, I have, the guy's asking for money, and he says, I have no silver, and I have no gold, but what I do have, I give to you, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he pulls the guy to his feet. There's a bold move. The man is instantly healed. Instantly healed. And pandemonium ensues. 
Everyone recognises that this guy who's been lame for years and years and years is now up and walking. He's praising God. He's celebrating. He can't stop praising him. He's going absolutely nuts. The crowd starts together to gather. And as, as, they, as he does, this guy is clinging on to Peter. He's so thankful. He's jumping up and down, clinging on to Peter. And Peter starts to preach the gospel. He starts to proclaim uh, the um, amazing things that God has done, and he starts to be really bold. This Je- he says it again, this Jesus whom you crucified, this Jesus who you put on the cross, he's the one who's healed this man. He's the one who has power to save, and you can come to him today. And it causes such an uproar that the religious leaders have to pay attention. The Jewish Sanhedrin finds out, and so what they do is essentially they sort of arrest Peter and John They pull them in front of what would have been about these 71 leaders and they start to ask them questions. Like, what name are you doing this? And all that sort of thing. So we're going to join the story. Acts 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. So you've got Peter and John stood in front of this quite important group of religious Jewish people. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power... Or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, there he is again, there's no stopping Peter, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Go on, Peter. I mean, you think, standing in front of 71 people who, remember, crucified Jesus. They were the guys who orchestrated that. Peter now stands and says, the one you rejected, the one you put on the cross, he's so bold. The one you crucified, he's the one healing. He's the one from whom there is no one else that can save, just him. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, hallelujah, if you're, give me an amen if you're an uneducated common man in the room. They, <laughs> thank you, the two of you that joined in there. <laughs> uh, when, they, when they saw that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. <laughs> That's a great story. They want a level complaint at them, but there's this guy who's just been healed by the power of God. A sign and a wonder. John preached so well on this last week. We need signs and wonders. I haven't got time really to touch into it today. But we need to get on our knees and cry out to God that the power, his manifest power is made available to us. That we can see the sick healed. We can see people delivered. We can see people set free. We can have stuff with us in the background that when complaints come, we say, no, look, the power of God is at work. They had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them, sorry, verse 15, But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they decide that the, the miracle is undeniable, but we'll tell them to shut up, because we don't want them spreading these horrible news and these rumors. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. 
For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. And I just want to read now this prayer that happens next. 20, verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. What a great story. Fantastic story, another courtroom drama, but one that we can learn so, so much from. Peter and John versus 71 religious leaders. The same religious leaders, as I said before, that crucified Christ, and they are not backing down. They are incredibly bold, and we need that boldness. First thing I want to notice from this passage is it's interesting as they pray to God, they don't pray for the circumstances to change. Threats are coming. The council is speaking against them. They're trying to shut them down, essentially. And rather than Peter and John and the rest of the disciples turning and praying, Lord, would you change their minds? Lord, would you change what's going on out there? God, would you fix it so that we can be a bit more comfortable when we share our faith? They don't pray that. What they pray is, God, you know what's happening. Give us boldness. Give us boldness. Before they pray that God would do something out there, they pray, God, would you do something in here? Lord, would you transform something in me so that whatever the circumstances, whatever the context of our nation, whatever our culture looks like, yes, we must pray for that. We must pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our government. We need to pray for those who are lost and in this world. But predominantly and primarily, we must pray for boldness for ourselves to stand firm in this crooked generation. Where does this boldness come from? I want to look at four things from our passage, if I can. We can be bold because God is sovereign. We can be bold because we've been with Jesus. We can be bold because we've been baptized in the Spirit. And we can be bold because we're already dead. That one got your attention. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Firstly, we can be bold because God is sovereign. Look at how their prayer begins. Sovereign Lord, verse 24. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And then they talks about how David had prophesied about what was coming and how that was utterly fulfilled. And then in verse 28, he says, uh, all these evil people that were doing these evil things, they were to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. The first thing, the first thing they want to do to ensure their boldness, to stir boldness within themselves, is to remember that God is sovereign. God is in control. You're not praying to just anybody here. This is not a, a potentially, this situation might go bad or it might be good, so we need to sort of stir some stuff. No, they are praying to the one from whom all power in the universe resides. Sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth. They are reminding themselves that when God speaks, incredible things happen. He says, let there be and there is, right? 
He speaks creation into being. He speaks stars and the universe and the seas and the creatures and the animals. He makes all things. He is incredibly powerful. The one for which nothing is impossible. That's who we pray to. That's who we go to for boldness. When we remember that God is in control, everything changes. Everything changes. When we fix our minds and we meditate on the purposes of God and the power of God, it should feed boldness in us to know, Lord, that you're in control whether things are going good right now or whether things are going bad. Nothing is outside of your knowledge. I belong to you. I know that you're good. And so I can be bold and very courageous because of who I belong to. It's about you and remembering you. He's sovereign over the good things, like creation. He's sovereign over the bad. We could get into the ins and outs of does God cause these things to happen? No, he's, not, he's not negligible for evil. Have I said that the right way around? He's not responsible, sorry. But he's sovereign. He's in control. They said this, for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This is actually incredibly powerful for us to get hold of. I will never forget, um, it's a, this is a, a third, fourth-hand story I'm nicking from you, John, I hope you don't mind, but John told once this story about a lady on joining God's family, our old uh, membership course, who, uh, I think her son had been killed, is that right? Her son had been murdered back home. Was she from? Motorbike. Oh, was in a motorbike accident. And she believed for years and years and years that the devil essentially had stolen her son away because this was an act of evil it didn't make any sense to her and actually through the course and as she was going through and hearing this truth about God's sovereignty and God being in charge and being in control actually John was able to say to her no God is the author of life am I getting this right he's in control and suddenly she was set free Suddenly she realized the devil hasn't won a victory here. This is God who's in control and I can trust him with the good stuff and I can trust him with the bad. I don't have to carry around now this wonder, uh, this wondering of how the enemy has possibly won this victory. No, God, it's all you. You're in control and that is good news. When we know and we remember the sovereignty of God, it changes everything. To know God is sovereign means that we're in, we know that we're in safe hands. See, when you move out in the act of boldness, when you stand firm in the workplace, or when you declare uh, and proclaim your faith, if God is not ultimately sovereign, then that means it could go one or two ways. But if he's sovereign and he knows what's happening, he can use it. He can use it, even if you're stumbling over your words like I am this morning a little bit. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said this, Cheer up, Christian. Things are not left to chance. No blind fate rules the world. God hath purposes, and those purposes are fulfilled. God hath plans, and those plans are wise and never can be dislocated. Boldness starts with knowing that God is in control. And so they pray to a big God, and then they feel the confidence to say. So they unpack this sovereignty of God. They say, Lord, you made the heavens and the earth. You prof David prophesied this and it was going to happen. You said it was going to happen and it did happen. You're in control. And then they say, so look upon their threats. Now look upon their threats. You can see they're, they're getting their theology right so that they can pray right. It's like, God, you, you're so powerful. If you just look, just look, you'll know exactly what to do. Lord, look upon their threats, the God who is ultimately in control. We can be bold because God is sovereign. Second point, we can be bold because we've been with Jesus. I love this little verse in verse 13 of our passage. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Didn't make sense for Peter and John, these uneducated fishermen, to be stood before them, declaring the wonders of God, moving in the power of God. It doesn't make sense. They haven't received an education. They're commoners. They're commoners. They're just, they're just normal blokes. 
And here they are, moving in power. They had no other option than to recognize that they had been with Jesus. So boldness may start with knowing that God is ultimately sovereign, but it takes on a whole different dynamic once we spend time in his presence. Once we spend time in his presence, something of the boldness of Jesus is imparted to us. This is what happened. Peter has learned from the best here. He's learned from his master. Jesus is incredibly bold. And as we spend time with him, as we read his word, as we worship, as we meditate on his goodness, as we fellowship together and bless one another, as we do whatever it is we need to do to get into the presence of God, we can be transformed by him. As we read his word, as we worship, as we enjoy this eternal relationship with him, we cannot help but begin to be transformed into his image and likeness. So you and I, if you're Christian here today, we're being transformed day by day into the image of Christ. There's a wonderful example uh, in Acts of what this looks like, particularly for Peter. Uh, But to explain it, I need us to go back to Mark chapter 5. Don't turn them in your Bibles unless you want to. Um, But uh, there's a story in Mark's gospel about this guy called Jairus. Jairus has a very, very sick, very unwell daughter. And he hears about this Jesus who's moving in power. He's healing the sick. And so he goes to find him and he says, my daughter's unwell. Would you come? Would you come? And Jesus sort of calms him down a little bit and he says, yeah, that's okay. I'll come with you. And so they agree to go. And as they're going, Jesus by this time is gathering big crowds. And there's a big crowd gathered around him and he's traveling with Jairus to his house. And then we get the story of the woman with the issue of blood who sees Jesus passing with Jairus through the crowd, and so she pushes her way through. She's been struggling with this horrible sickness for years and years and years, and she thinks, if I can just touch him, that will be enough. He touches her cloak. Power comes out of him and heals her instantly, so much so that Jesus has to take note. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. He stops everybody. He says, who touched me? I felt power go out from me. Story of faith. Faith activating the power of God. Isn't that wonderful? We don't have time to go into it today. But in all this hubbub and all this other stuff going on, somebody else runs to the crowd and informs Jairus that his daughter has died. In one sense, they are glorifying God because this woman has been wonderfully and miraculously healed. But whilst all this has been taking place, time's run out and the little girl dies. We'll pick up the story. I'll read this to you. This is Mark 5, verse 35. Whilst he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So Peter's there, watching, learning, in the presence of Jesus. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Such a ridiculous statement for Jesus to make, that they go from their wailing to laughter. Because it's awkward, it's weird, it doesn't make sense. She's dead. What, you you madman coming to tell us that she's just asleep. But he put them all outside, gets rid of the doubters, (laughs) and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. So Jesus takes this little girl's hand. Peter's there watching. And he says, Talitha kumi, little girl, arise. Remember those words, Talitha kumi. Can you say it with me? Talitha kumi. (laughs) Flash forward to Acts chapter 9. Peter finds himself in a similar situation. I'll read through this quickly. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha. Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. And in those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. 
And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. Really similar story so far, right? Someone's died, we need you to come. And when he arrived, he took him to the up, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter puts them all outside. Where do you learn to do that? Interesting. And knelt down and prayed. And it's not written here, but I'm pretty sure he might have taken her hand. That's conjecture, I'm adding that in, sorry. And turning to the body, he says, Tabitha, kumi. Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand, there it is, and raised her up. <laughs> and then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. See, Peter had learned so well from his master. He'd watched him do it, spent time in his presence, understood what it meant to move in power and in grace. Follow, he wants to follow right in the footsteps of Jesus. And when we spend time with him, his words become our words. The things he loves become the things that we love. The things he hates become the things that we hate. In Jesus, we see boldness in its most perfect form, coupled with grace, peace, humility. See, boldness, if it's not applied correctly, can turn into brashness, can be harsh, can be overbearing. Actually, Jesus is the perfect image of what it means to be bold. And the way that Peter handles himself in front of these 71 religious leaders reminds them of Jesus. They're uneducated men. There's no way they could have learned to do this. The only way that they could have picked up this sort of boldness and this sort of courage is because they'd spent time in his presence. We must be those who are marked by the presence of God. Do you make time for it in your day-to-day -day life? Whatever it is, however you find it easiest to connect with God, whether that's through reading scripture, listening to worship, whether it's through fellowshipping with other believers and sharing your faith, whatever that means for you to get into his presence, please make that. We must be those who are marked out by it. So it's a distinctive. We can be bold because we've spent time in his presence. Thirdly, we can be bold because we've been baptized in the Spirit. Ch uh, verse 8 of our text. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, I don't know if you've picked this up by now, but we are going to ring this bell every single sermon we preach in Acts. I'm just commissioning our future preachers, whatever they look like, whatever, whatever passage you come to, guys, we must be those who preach and believe and cry out for and cling on to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need his spirit. We need that transforming, that experience, that experience of God coming, his indwelling presence coming upon you, filling you with power so that you know, that you know, that you know, that you're ready to go. That's where boldness comes from. This is what it looks like. It changes everything. I've got news for us Christians. We're no match for the world by ourselves and all it throws of us. We're no match. You look at stories like this, this ridiculous story from this tribunal and think, what, what can I do about that? I'm no match for the world and the way it's changing, the way it hates God. I'm no, I'm no match for the enemy and his schemes and, and what's coming. I'm no match. I can't stand in my own, my own strength. I've got nothing to give. But with the Holy Spirit, I'm a world changer. With the Holy Spirit, you're a world changer. Baptized in the Spirit, you can move and advance the kingdom of God. You can be as ambassador on this earth. You can proclaim the gospel and see people saved. We can heal the sick. We can see people delivered. It's the baptism of the Spirit that we must be desperate for. And if you have any question marks at all this morning over whether you have or you haven't, please make sure that you have. Come, we want to pray for you. We want to lay hands on you. We want to be filled with the Spirit and the power, not so that you can just shake or wobble, so that you can be bold and live for Him in this world. 
We must be those who cling on and believe in and preach in the baptism of the Spirit. Every single act of kingdom advancing boldness in the whole of the book of Acts is directly related to people being filled in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. You won't, you won't find any act of boldness outside it. It was so attractive and so clearly demonstrably powerful that later on in Acts, a man tries to buy it. Comes to Peter and the disciples and he says, hey, it's a Simon the Magician. He says, I'll have some of that. I'll have some of that. I'll offer you money. He gets really told off, by the way. This is not something you can buy. This is the supernatural power of God to enable his believers to live the life that God has called them to live. I'll say it again. You didn't get it. <laughs> this is... <laughs> See, Simon wanted to buy an experience. <laughs> That's great. I didn't get it. This usually happens to me. There we go. I'll say it again. Simon, the magician, in that passage in Acts, we haven't read it, but he tries to buy the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's trying to buy an experience. He's trying to buy a one-off thing that will make a, you know, he might be able to sell and make some money from. That's his intention. He wants to buy it so that he can sell it on and give it to others. And Peter tells him off because that's not the purpose of the baptism in the Spirit. It's not just so that you might have a nice experience. It's so that you have the power to live the life. That is why we must be desperate for it. We must cling to it. We must cry out to God for it. Hudson Taylor said this, Many Christians estimate difficulty in light of their own resources, and thus they attempt very little and they always fail. Anybody ever been like, I've done this so many times in my life. You think, I've actually not got that much to give. So I'm actually not going to attempt that much. And even the thing that I do attempt is probably going to fail. Because it's just me. He then says this, all giants, giants of the faith, have been weak men, hallelujah, who did great things for God because they reckoned on his power and presence to be with them. series is called World Changers. If we stand any chance at all of living up to that wonderful title, we must be those who are baptized in the Spirit. Just an interesting aside, it's interesting that there's no explicit mention of Peter being filled with the Spirit when he heals the lame beggar. It's obviously related. It's obviously in there. I'm just pointing out the it's, it's implicitly implied that he's filled with the Spirit. Otherwise, where on earth do you get the courage to yank up a lame man to his feet? That's a spirit move. But the Bible is very clear that just before Peter proclaims the gospel, just before the proclamation of the truth, it says, and Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them. It's almost like Luke, in his writing of this, is trying to make a point. that Actually, there is something... Funda there's a fundamental link between preaching the gospel and being filled with the Spirit. As a primary, as we share our faith, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, as you open your mouth and share with your friends and declare to neighbors and loved ones that God is good, that he loves them, that Jesus died for them, as you share that message, God will back you up. He'll be with you, and he'll bless you in that. So we can be bold because we've been baptized in the Spirit. Lastly, we can be bold because we're already dead. I need to thread the needle a little bit on this one, so bear with me. In the Gospels, we meet a Peter who is brash, seemingly sure of himself. He's got a big mouth and an awful lot of front. He's the guy who always pipes up with the wrong thing at the wrong time. Some, it's sometimes in, with good heart, we think. He's the one who jumps up and, you know, Jesus will say, I'm going to the cross. And he says, no, Lord, we won't let it happen. We won't let them harm you. I'll stick with you, Jesus. I'll never leave you, Jesus. I'm yours, Jesus. I'll follow you, Jesus. But we know what happens. He actually says at the Last Supper, I'd rather die than deny you. But when push comes to shove, Death's just too frightening for Peter. Jesus turns around and says to him, you'll deny me three times, Peter. You're going to run away. And he did. He loved his life more than he loved his master. He denies him. 
So broken by this experience that Jesus has to do personal pastoral ministry with Peter on the beach after he's resurrected. The three denials are now met with three affirmations. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Tend my lambs. Peter, do you love me? The third one, Peter gets it and he understands what's happening and so broken he can't even answer properly. Lord, you know. You know. You know my heart now. Just feed my sheep. And then there's a little bit after that which we rarely read. Where Jesus says, when you were a young man, you used to dress yourself and you'd choose where you want to go. When you get old, someone else will dress you and lead you down a path that you do not want to go down. And then there's a little bit in brackets which says he said this to describe to him the manner by which he was to die for the glory of God. So this broken Peter who was terrified of death now sits in front of a man who has defeated it. The resurrected Jesus sits in front of him. The one who death had no hold on him. And Jesus puts him back together and then says to him, I've called you to die for my sake. See, for me, when I read this, I think, goodness me, that would terrify me. Wouldn't that upset you? To be told, actually, that you're going to be martyred for your faith? Those of us who know Jesus, uh, Peter, he was killed for his faith. He was probably crucified upside down. That's how he died, for the sake of Jesus' name. And he knew that from the beginning of his ministry. But somehow for Peter, this is not a point of fear. This doesn't become a place of he's now terrified of anything that might happen. There's a terrible film. I hope none of you have watched it. There's been loads of them, but it's called Final Destination. And the plot of the film is that these kids, these high school kids, one of them has a vision, a premonition that the plane they're on is going to crash. It's going to go down. And, uh, and so he freaks out and he gets his friends off the plane. And they're all like, what are you doing? This is essentially this sort of half kicked off, half uh, let off. And then you see the plane take off and it explodes in midair. And they spend the rest of their time running away from death because death is chasing after them. It's going to get them. It's going gonna, it's gonna to seek them out, and they all die in a horrible manner of ways. Don't watch the film. It's not good. It's good. It's quite entertaining, but don't watch it. It's not good. <laughs> and for Peter, you think maybe this is what's going to happen. Jesus has just broken to him that he's going to die in a manner of death that will glorify him. And you think, for, surely for Peter, this would mean he's always looking over his shoulder. Oh, no. Maybe today's the day. But that's not what we see. With Peter, we now see a man who's not scared of death at all. He's bold and courageous. He's standing up in front of baying crowds who wanted Jesus' blood and saying, this Jesus whom you crucified is now able to save you. If you would turn and repent of your sins, you can receive salvation. He's pulled up in front of a courtroom and they say, look, you keep speaking, we're going to hurt you. And he says, you decide what you want to do. I can't stop speaking what I've seen and heard. I'm going to keep going. He's incredibly bold. This happens time and time again, sometimes to the point where they are beaten to within an inch of their life, but so transformed is Peter that he goes away rejoicing, rejoicing in the sufferings of Jesus, that he would be count worthy, counted worthy of sharing in his sufferings. He's imprisoned later, I think, in Acts 12 or somewhere nearby there, and we find that actually on death row, waiting to be killed, he is sleeping like a baby. Sleeping like a baby. His, the, the disciples are outside. They're praying. They're in a different house. There's an earthquake. He's set free. He got, it's a funny story. We'll get there. We will preach it. But he's sleeping. On death row, he's sleeping like a baby. What has happened to Peter? How come this premonition of his death isn't crippling him? It's freeing him. Because he knows that death has been defeated. He knows that Jesus has risen. And now even the last enemy has nothing on him. It cannot touch him. See, as Christians, our worst case scenario is what? Your worst case scenario is glory. That's what's in front of you if you belong to Jesus. Glory. Every pursuit you make in the purposes of God, glory awaits. Whether it's hardship and difficulty, glory is at the end of it. That is where you end up. That's what amazing thing that Jesus has done. Jesus is victorious over death. If you belong to him, you can't really be touched. 
Not really. Yeah, maybe a little bit of physical harm, maybe a bit of persecution, maybe some bad words about us. But we, when we remember that ultimately he's won and that glory awaits, it should transform us into incredibly bold people, just like Peter. Paul writes in Corinthians, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, be bold, be courageous, don't back down, keep pressing in, this world needs to hear about Jesus, keep on going, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Church. We must be those in the face of the world and the way that it is turning who stand firm. May Christ Central Church be known as a church that stands firm, full of love, full of compassion, full of mercy, full of grace. Anyone from any walk of life can walk through these doors and come and enjoy this meeting, but we will stand firm on the truth and not move from it. We will not budge. <laughs> Feeling like Winston Churchill right now. <laughs> this is not the beginning. It is the beginning. No. It's not the beginning because I'm nearly finished. We're near the end. We must stand firm. We must be bold. Death has been defeated. For some of us, I'm aware that this has very, very real consequences. It does for me. I think about friends and loved ones who have a completely different worldview from me completely different like aggressively different and for me to stand firm means for me to be disliked and confession time guys i struggle with that i've always wanted people to like me but actually i have the pleasure of god over me I have the smile of Jesus over me. He stands and honors me. There's a wonderful story in Acts chapter 7. Stephen stands again in this typical courtroom-like setting and he's asked to give a defense for why he's continually preaching the gospel. And he preaches this amazing sermon. He takes them through right from Abraham through to where they are now, explaining the prophets and the patriarchs and the purposes of God, all working together for this one moment. And just when you think he's about to give the appeal, and say, if you would come to Jesus, you can be saved. He doesn't. Full of the Spirit, he points the finger. He says, you brood of vipers, you evil men. You killed the prophets. You are to blame for all of the evil that's around right now. And they go wild. We're told that there's gnashing of teeth. They take him outside and they throw stones at him. They rip his garments apart. And as he's on the floor, ready to die, he looks up to heaven and sees Jesus. Now Jesus, we're told, when he said it is finished and he's risen to hell, he's now seated at the right hand of the Father in a place of honor. Right? He's sitting down. Jesus right now. Seated. The work's finished. He's done. But as he sees Stephen and this bold act of following him, Jesus stands. And so when Stephen looks up, he sees Jesus standing to honor him. Yes, I want my loved ones to like me and to love me. I want people there out there to think well of me. But not ever will that become more important than the smile of God over my life. I want to live for him. I want to receive his adoration. I want to get there in that place of glory and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. The world is not getting nicer. It's not becoming more accommodating when it comes to Jesus. If you read through the whole of the Bible, you find out things keep going south. Wars, famines. But God is faithful. And we're called to live for him right now. Let's be a people who know that God is sovereign, 
who are marked by his presence, who are continually filled with the Spirit, and who don't love their lives even unto death. We know the end of the story. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Can we pray? Can I invite you to stand? I just ask you to lift your hands out in front of you. Sovereign Lord, (laughs) who made the heavens and the earth and everything in it, the one who is all powerful, the one for whom every, every, everything was made and is made and has been made, it's all through him and for him and to him, all things, they belong to you, they're for you, you spoke them into being, they, you are so, so powerful God, we call upon you now and we ask you Lord, as the world makes its threats and as the world goes its own way, Father, would you fill us with boldness? Fill us with boldness that we might declare your word to this crooked and wicked generation. Lord, please fill us with boldness to show forgiveness and love like the young man we saw on the video earlier. Lord, please fill us with boldness that we might proclaim the works of the Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we might become more comfortable, Lord, with being a little bit offensive. Lord, not in a brash way, but in a way that holds firm to the truth. God, we want to put your glory first and foremost in our hearts and minds. And we want to live for you. Lord, I pray for doctors in this room. Lord, who are being uh, pressured and pushed to go down a different path than the one that they know is right. Lord, be with them. Bless them. Give them boldness and courage. Father, I want to pray for teachers who teach young people and children as these moves of confusion over gender and sexuality are now being perpetrated and promoted in our school systems. God, give Christian teachers boldness and courage and wisdom in how to stand firm in their day. For every person here who has a workplace and knows the pressure of the liberal environment that they experience. God, give us boldness and courage, please, for every evangelist in the room. I pray for an increase in boldness and courage upon us, that we might declare the word faithfully, faithfully to this broken world. And Lord, for the rest of us, boldness and courage to follow the way of Jesus, to stand firm and to follow you. Lord, we want to be yours. We commit our lives to you again. We say, here we are, God. Send us. Send us. In Jesus' name. Amen.